Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> o hope of the living and harbor of rest, where the weary in this world find rest, May we be received into the harbor of reconciliation <clears throat> and into the place of rest with all those who please your divine will. And we raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. <clears throat> Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Lord, have mercy on us and save us. O Christ, our God, inflame our hearts with love, that we may love you and each other. Fill us with faith and confirm us in true and firm hope. May we persevere in good deeds so that we may be justified by you. Please your will all the days of our lives and glorify and thank you now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Have mercy on me, O God, according to your merciful love, according to your great compassion, Blot out my transgressions. O oh, wash me completely from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. My transgressions are to me, my sins are to be for me. Against you, Lord, I have sinned. What is evil in your sight? Seeing guilt, I was born, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Yes, you delight in sincerity of heart. In secret, you teach me wisdom. Cleanse me with his soap, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. a pure heart for, for me, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Rescue me from bloodshed, O God, God of my salvation. And then my tongue shall ring out your justice. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. <clears throat> good pleasure show favor to Sion, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in right sacrifice, burnt offerings wholly consumed, then you will be offered young bulls on your altar. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Praise, glory, and honor. The Lord of the Trinity. Burn this incense.
Que eleição. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the gate of mercy. Open to sinners who knock on it. The His hope, who purifies the impure, who come close to Him. To the good one be glory and honor on this day and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Glory to you, O Holy One. You descended from the heavenly dwellings to the earthly depths. In your compassion you took the form of a slave to forgive your servants. You walked on the waves of the sea in order to sanctify Adam, who was created in the image of your majesty. O Lord, you sanctify those who are pure, impure, and with your hyssop you purified sinners and made them whiter than snow. Through your powerful grace, forgive me and your servants who ask you for the pardon of their faults and the forgiveness of their sins. As you forgave the family of Cornelius through the hand of Simon Peter the Apostle, in like manner, may pardon of sins descend upon us and upon all the children of your flock who have been redeemed by your precious blood. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Oh, heavenly high priest, 
you died because of our sins. You who are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the sanctifying his soul who cleansed our wounds in your compassion. You are the treasure of your Father. Through you and with you our supplications are heard. Our faults are forgiven, our souls are protected. And on the glorious day of your second coming, mercy shall be given to us. And we will raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Just the reg it's the regular, that's right, it's the regular one. It's just our regular Masmuro. Go ahead, FIFA, you're our, you're our. I have sinned against heaven and before you said the sun. Though my heart now condemns me, you are greater than my heart. When the just offered worship, you were pleased, O Lord our God. Now be pleased with our worship, in your mercy hear our prayers. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and her children forever. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away, and see, everything has become new. All this from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us all. So, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Praise be to God always. Amen. and ask for your mercy, O Lord.
שלמה אל כל כונה. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint Matthew who proclaimed life unto the world let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Grace out to the listeners, the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the Lord. The Apostle Matthew writes, And the next day, the one following the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we recall that this impostor, while still alive, had said, After three days I will be raised up. Give orders, then, that the grave be secured until the third day, lest his disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, He has been raised from the dead. And this last imposture would be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, The guard is yours. Go, secure it as best you can. And so they went, and they secured the tomb by fixing a seal to the stone and setting the guard. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, for giving us his words of life. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. Go and secure it as best you can. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the Eastern traditions, in fact, all the, in the Catholic Church, we say it in the Apostles' Creed, that he was crucified, died, and was buried, that he descended into hell. We have it in the Apostles' Creed. We say it even in the Latin Church, but it just goes right by us. Saturday of the Light is the act of salvation. And the Eastern Church have retained this doctrine. It is the moment where the divinized soul of the Messiah in his death enters into the abode of death, into Sheol. And there he brings peace, he brings salvation, he brings healing. So for many people, Saturday was just, just a day of waiting. But in fact, it is the pivotal moment of the work of salvation in which the Messiah, who has come to teach his people Israel, Israel, many of them have received, but Israel as the people have not received him. He is put to death, so he is with the nation that he has prepared. He is on the earth. He has taught also even those outside of Israel with the pagans. And now in death, he goes to the dead. To all of those from the time of Adam who have died, he goes down to bring this announcement of the gospel, to bring the tidings of salvation to those, to bring peace and to bring light. We see it in the anaphora, excuse me, in the Ramsha that we sang for the day. It's very much the emphasis that this is the day of salvation. The death, the movement, death and resurrection, but between the death and the resurrection is Saturday of the light that preaching in the abode of the dead that reconciles both heaven and earth, the dead and the living, and all of these things are brought together within the sacred heart to be raised up to God in peace. That's its fundamental meaning this day. And so I use the quotation at this beginning of St. Matthew, go and secure it as best you can. This idea then that they go to, the, they go to Pilate the following day on Saturday, and they say, look, he's already, a, he's already an imposter. And if his disciples are just as bad as he is, if not worse, they'll go and they'll steal the body out of the tomb. And then they're going to say, see, it's empty. 
And they said, surely we have to try to avoid this. It'll become worse otherwise. So for three days, we have to put this. This is why there's guards there. But it's the little nuance where Pilate says, you have a guard, you take care of yourself. Go and secure it as best you can. The machinations of human beings, our thoughts, our desires, the way we want things to work. We've considered in these last few days, Judas. Judas does evil things, not because he's demonic, but because he's just a man who is selfish and makes bad decisions. And in the end, it becomes quite evil. So we've looked at Judas, we've seen this aspect, but it's all of this idea of how Judas tries to maneuver our Lord. It is that aspect then of how we in our lives, our natural tendency is to maneuver, to secure as best we can, to try to set things up the way we want. It should be this way, it should be that way, it mustn't be this way, it's that we never be that way. And all of these things cause unrest within us because we're always trying to hang on to things that are not in our control. And if you remember over these last couple of months now, over Lent, we've, we've come to the, often the idea of what is paganism? What is idolatry except the pursuit of power and control? Doing magic to make the weather work in a certain way, to raise the dead, to learn the future. It's control and the pursuit of power. That is the essence of idolatry. And to the degree in our lives that we try to pursue that control and that power, we are idolaters. We are creating image. Idol just means image. We are creating something according to our liking that is not necessarily what God wants, even when it's good. This is why we consider the fall of Judah. If you had asked Judas at any moment in what he was doing with the temple authorities, he's saying, I'm trying to do something bigger. I'm going to have it so that Jesus does something really good and that will be beneficial. He has told himself that my intentions make everything that I do good. And that's just totally false. The entire modern world lives that way. That the intention justifies everything. That is control and idolatry. That is the pursuit of making something be. And because I want it to be be, I want it to be good, then everything I choose to do has to be good because my intention's good and my desire is good. And in that aspect is idolatry because we're trying to form our lives and the circumstances around us according to an image, our image, according to our ideas, our thoughts. And so when we bring all this idea of the idolatry that we have considered over the weeks now, these seven weeks of the great fast, and to consider this idea of trying to hang on to things, and then coming to its pinnacle during the great and holy week of the Passion with Judas's machinations, trying to maneuver our Lord so that he will have to do a miracle bigger than anything else he's done, seen by thousands, tens of thousands of people in Jerusalem, it all falls on its face. And because he lived in that illusion, it's why he commits suicide in despair. You see the shattering of that idol which takes place when he realizes our Lord does nothing and then is dragged away in bondage. That is why Judas commits, falls into despair and then kills himself. Peter, Peter denies our Lord just because he's weak. He's weak and people are accusing me and they're after me. And so he denies knowing our Lord because he's weak. And so that is what opens up. He's not trying to control the situation. If anything, he'd try to control. All he's doing is stomping around and swearing and saying, I don't know this man. And they keep coming at him. This is very human. We all understand that one. You know, my colleagues over the, at the water cooler in the cafeteria, please, I don't want to see her. She's going to ask me those questions. He's such a jerk. And you see what happens in life is because we live by these images that we create. It is what causes the rift the grudges, the, brand, the brokenness between human relationships. Because when you have individuals who are each trying to control the manipulation, the control, and trying to hold on to these things, ultimately to become idolaters, or as St. James says in his letter, to become adulterers with this world. 
trying to find this world, make these things work, make these things work this way. They fornicate with the world. In the Old Testament, the, the prophets talk about idolatry as being an act of fornication. You are going after something else that is not God. This becomes fundamentally our brokenness of our relationships and this discord and lack of understanding. And ultimately, in many individuals, grudges. You just sit on it and it just churns volcanically within us. This is why in the Byzantine tradition, at the beginning of Lent, you have what's called Clean Monday. Ours is Ash Monday. But you begin the Clean Sunday, you begin the first day of the Great Fast by a ceremony of reconciliation. And you would go to the church for Ramsha, the evening, Vespers, opening up the Monday, like we do, uh, you would do the opening of Ash Wednesday on Sunday evening of, well, for us, Cana Sunday. And you would have the ceremony of forgiveness, not the same ceremony, but the same idea of the idea of reconciliation, that you descended from heaven to bring us peace and to bring us salvation. And you entered into the depths of the earth to bring salvation even to the dead. So now allow us to bring reconciliation and peace among ourselves. You have forgiven us, so allow us to forgive one another. And you would have in the ceremony where people would actually kneel down next to each other in front of them and ask whoever it is next to them for forgiveness. It was a way to begin, so that when we do the sign of peace at liturgy, it's one of the most misunderstood things in the liturgy these days. It becomes a 4th of July meet and greet, waving and, 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 and shouting to each other across pews. It's horrific. And that's not what's happening liturgically. What's happening liturgically is it passes from the priest to the ministers and to the ministers to the people, one on one. Peace be to you and with your spirit. To the next person, peace be with you and with your spirit. Because what is taking place there is not reconciliation. It is the peace of Christ that flows from the divine altar among his members of his body. That is why it's not saying hello to people. It is the peace that's why it moves from the altar through the ministers and into the body of Christ. Like we incense the altar and the husoyo, which is that, which is that sacramental of forgiveness, and then the ministers and then the whole body of Christ in this forgiveness within the incense. And so the peace that flows. And so you had specific ceremonies like today. And it's lovely to see all of you here today. This is something that because we live in the Western world, this ceremony is so much forgotten and not actually availed of. But this is the pinnacle of all we've done for the last seven weeks on our personal level is to find this reunion and this reconciliation, both with God and our confessions, but also with one another to begin to break and to let go of our desire to secure things as best you can but to learn how to actually let go, which is terrifying. Because we want all of our 401ks, we want our insurance policies, we want all these things. We live in a world which lives by such terror, not because it's sheepish, but because it's trying to remove all pain and suffering. Because it wants security. This is the terror that surrounds us. And so, what this understanding of the reconciliation of the right of forgiveness is, is we learn how to let go so that in following God, we will have a greater ability to be at peace with one another. It doesn't mean peace will always be found with everyone. Even St. Paul says in his letters, he says, be at peace with all men insofar as you are able. And our Lord himself, of course, was betrayed by Judas. So, it is a lesson to us that the world is never going to be whatever they say these days of rainbows and unicorns. That is not the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel is to learn the love of God and that God is in charge, that God is the power by which goodness and salvation enter the world, both for the living and the dead. And when we understand that, then we know that every single moment in our lives is in that light of infinite charity and in that light of infinite wisdom. So even when my car smacks into the stop sign, inadvertently, just a pure accident, God's love and God's wisdom is still being manifested. 
That makes life become something totally different. Not getting out and kicking the car and screaming at the other driver who made you swerve or the dog that jumped into the road. But that it always winds up being a place of peace. It doesn't mean I'm not angry because I've crushed my car and now I've lost the whole afternoon because the tow truck has to come. Those things are inevitable. But there will always be peace. Because I understand that in the midst of all of this disturbance, God is still in charge, God is still guiding, and God is still teaching me. And one of the things he's teaching me is that appointment I was trying to get to in a hurry wasn't that important. And my anxiousness of controlling and organizing and doing all these things is not the path of God. We organize and we foresee the future by the virtue of prudence. That's a different thing. Not by agendas and not by any kind of reminders coming off of our phones. And so this is what reconciliation is about. And when we live in that way, what St. Paul is saying to us is that in our lives, we cannot avoid having enemies. There will always be enemies. But what we can do in our lives is to work to the point that that enmity has as little, if not nothing, to do with me. We've all known individuals who go through their lives with the proverbial chip on their shoulder. They're always angry. It doesn't mean they're raging. It just means they're always in tension. And when anything goes wrong, boom, they explode. Or boom, they hold a grudge. Or they just become passive aggressive. Or they become, they're going vindictive. They're going to get you later on. We know them. And these people are to be pitied because they, they're absolutely miserable. You can't live life on an edge like this all the time by trying to secure and control and have all these things. It's filled with fear, and it's filled with pain. And they bring, as a result, also great pain to other people because they're always exploding, always on edge, always. That is precisely the opposite of what the right of reconciliation is about. And so that when we understand that, when our Lord enters among his people in Israel and among the dead, this day of the descent into hell, he is bringing the peace that can only come from God in order to bring that radiance of consolation and of hope and of peace and bringing all of these things together. And so having received all of these gifts, let us ask the, great, the Lord in great gratitude to thank him first and foremost for what he is desiring to teach us and that we ask that he fill our souls with that wisdom and with that charity so that we ourselves will not only be at peace, by letting go with all that we possibly can be, but that we also become agents of peace to communicate it also to others and to bring a sense of calm and not of terror even to the modern world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We will continue with the supplication on what is marked page 87 in your little booklets. O oh, hearts full of anger, take heed. Go make peace with your foes, and embrace them with love and compassion. And great on your soul, Jesus Christ. As he humbled himself, you should humble yourselves and grant pardon. Does anger still reign in your hearts? Then you turn from the Lord, Christ who died on the cross, your true teacher, if love for your neighbor is gone, then you hate Jesus Christ, who taught mercy and love and forgiveness. Let Christ be our teacher and guide, for he showed us the way to forgive from all hearts. Imitate him. All foes will be turned into friends, and together in peace we'll sing praises to him who forgave us. Let all us confess, adore, and praise the most holy and glorious Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
May God bless you in the peace of the Sacred Heart and the radiance of his victory forever. Amen. Amen.